So I would like to get started with day two of the Thinking and Working Politically Learning and Future Symposium. Um, I am Tom Bridal. I am the practice lead for democracy and governance at Commonics International. Uh, many of my colleagues are in Washington today, and so it's, it's fantastic to actually be in person. Even more fantastic to welcome a whole group of people from around the world, literally, to talk about this topic. Yesterday was, I just thought, absolutely really thrilling in a way that conferences so rarely are, uh, because it focused on so many of the issues that that we have been grappling with. And it was it was really, really just eye-opening and remarkable to get so many good insights, to learn so much about what people are doing and to draw out some of these experiences, compare experiences in a way that we rarely get a chance to do. So yesterday, the the focus was on uh, unpacking what what where we are. Today, the focus is on learning more. The focus is on, uh, yesterday, the focus was on learning. Today, the focus is more on how we move forward. Um, we try at Commodix when we can to invest in greater learning about development practice in general, TWP specifically. And yesterday, just to, to recap a couple of things, um, one of the things we heard about, which I thought was very insightful and important, were two studies that we worked on at Commonix. First, in collaboration with um, uh, with USAID, with John Rose, who you heard from, um, about the the use of TWP in procurements, how TWP appears in procurements, and how that how that kind of like how that drives our work because we are very much, of course, driven by what's what comes out of USAID and procurements. Um, the the findings there being one that a lot of this work, a lot of the TWP thinking is really still concentrated in DNG and in energy and natural resources. Um, uh, there's, there's an emerging emphasis uh, on TWP and climate change, which I thought was very interesting and important. But I think that there's also a need to sort of think about what the, the broader sectoral implications are and how do we bring this into other sectors as well. John also, in that study that he did with 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 Bryce Watson, who's who's on our team at at Comonix, really highlighted the the demand for more flexibility in how we do APEAs, the the applied political um, analysis, TWP, as Renee points out, thinking and working politically, um, and and that really actually connected very nicely with some comments at the end about what. What is a TWP? How do we define political economy analysis in a way that works for both uh, USAID, works for uh, the implementers, and, and really gets at some of the core issues? The the second study that we worked on, and and Renee who uh, Kentelberg who who is on the call and who who will hear from, is focused on what we learned internally. We looked at 17 projects that had a TWP component in them. Um, some of the findings from that, the key findings, I mean, we're, we're really talking about uh, the need for investment in PEAs and political economy analysis. It doesn't work when you do it in a shallow, uh, superficial way. You need to invest the time, the research, and you need, I think, you know, really the key is the dialogue with local staff and local experts to identify the question, right? The, 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 I think that the, the, you know, one of the almost universal rules of research, which applies also to political economy analysis, is that the quality of the question is what determines the quality of the is, is the, the the product or the pro you can't get a good research product from a bad question so the time that's invested in, in in clarifying the question understanding what it is that people want to understand uh pays off in, in the quality of the the work the the second aspect of that study which i thought was really interesting was the focus on on getting from 
thinking politically to working politically, right? This is the this is the challenge and how we can what are the what are the tools that we have to do that? One of them, I think, which I think we'll hear more about, and I think is is, is really key, is the integration and engagement with some of the work coming out of behavioral science, social behavioral change, systemic norms, um, and and how do you connect those two levels? You know, the the institutional systemic levels and the individual levels, and how connecting those is really ultimately what is what we're, we're seeing as driving change and reform in the public interest. The second panel yesterday, which was moderated by, by uh, Lina Rosha Menochal, who is the director of the Global Community of Practice for Thinking and Working and Politically, uh, which was fascinating for first because first because of the the participation from projects around the globe and especially from uh, our USAID colleagues in Peru talking about it from their perspective as a COR as a what does COR stand for Co uh, contract officers representative so the person who is really on a, on the day to day engagement with the implementers. Um, the one comment in there which I thought summarized so much of what we what we think about it and, and, and the concerns what came from the 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 chief of party in our, our project in the Philippines, um, uh, uh, Jem Armovic, who said that, yes, you know, we need to understand the rules of the game, right? The rules of the game are one of the sections that USAID asks for in their uh, applied political economy analysis format but we also need to understand the game within the rules that is to say how how uh particularly elites and and powerful forces use the rules to manipulate outcomes and you you see this very very in elections and how election rules are are, are manifested uh for example in the fact that um I think in many many cases, election 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 administrations are biased towards rural voters over urban voters, and that's done intentionally because there's a, a more a, a greater ability in many cases by authoritarian regimes to manipulate rural voters, and so they bias towards rural voters in the in the election rules, and that disadvantages them and disadvantages the opposition. You see it in. Um, uh, transparency regulations, you know, uh, uh, open uh, um, uh, FOIA regulations that that look like they are designed to increase access to information, but in fact are not. So this idea that you have to understand the uh, the rules of the game and the and the game that the rules are be are playing, I think that that was just just uh, just a just a, a really very necessary insight. The second uh, that came out of that conversation too was the emphasis on, on incentives. You know, what um, our project in Peru is doing, um, uh, this is a, it's a project around transparency and procurement uh, led by, I, I think a brilliant chief of party, Paolo Barragan. And um, she and her COR, I think had a really interesting exchange about the importance of incentives in, Building what they've what these networks of integrity, bringing together disparate groups with different incentives to move towards a common objective. I, I think that 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 emphasis on incentives is really key in uh, the, both the analysis and the design of projects. You know the the thing that makes projects, particularly in the, in the democracy and governance sector, so challenging is that. That we're, we we interact with with uh, par with participants uh, that have incentives that they move forward for. What is the difference the difference between a DG project, a government development project, and for example, a physics project? You know, is that a, a particle in a in a physics study doesn't have its own incentives. It doesn't doesn't seek to change the outcomes of a of of a research project. Whereas the interest groups we are working with and the communities we are dealing with have interests, and sometimes those interests are serve the public and broader interests. Sometimes they are opposed to the broader interests. It's it's like I've heard used this analogy before. You know, it's like a, a malaria project, an anti-malaria project, but 
we in the in, in many of the projects we we deal with it's like we need to engage with the mosquitoes right we need to think about the mosquitoes interests as well as everybody else's and they're not just mosquitoes these are sentient mosquitoes with real interests and they will fight and organize for their interests and we need to figure out ways of changing the interests of the mosquitoes changing the, in, the mosquitoes incentives so they have an incentive to do something which is more in the public interest than um, biting human beings and transmitting a virus we need to change the way that they think about themselves and their role in this ecosystem it's a tremendously challenging project and that's what makes i think some of the dg projects and and other kind of um projects across cross development sectors are realizing that this is kind of a, a part of the necessary task engaging with these communities to change interests change what you know is broadly called political will to align with um uh, uh the the public good and align with reform interests um Alina asked about in this in this discussion. I thought this was interesting too about the magic wand, and and really so many people came back to the idea of we need more flexibility in how PEAs are are implemented, uh, and, and the need for CORs like Sobeda in Peru, who who Paolo works with. So these were all just like fantastic discussions. We also had a great discussion with our closing speaker, who is uh, at FCDO, seconded but seconded to the bank about what is PEA, also I think a, a, a key discussion in this in this process. So just quickly today, um, I am also noting, noting the time, um, we move into the future. We talk about how to make development projects generate results that are driven by our political economy analysis. Um, we talk about what I think is really the, the key driver in a lot of our work, which is the emergence of local systems and how we support those local systems, local organizations. Um, how we integrate something that I keep talking about, which is the, the systems thinking and the behavioral change aspects with political economy assessments and political economy analysis. Um, and we'll, we'll hear some, I think, really interesting practical experiences and implementation on that uh, along those lines from our project uh, in the West Balkans, which is an SCDO project uh, from the center from uh, USA's Center for Economics and Market Development and a, and a firm that's doing, I think, really interesting work, Ideas 42 on this. And then the uh, the second session, one of my former colleagues at USAID, who's been not just a thought leader in the subject, but really a, 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 a passionate advocate for localization and the importance of local organizations in, in development and, and thinking through the challenges of, of that process. Uh, uh, David Jacobstein talking about how to, and it's, it's not really enough to say localized development, that the development is a local, local process, right, that we support together with um, uh, some speakers from the Ghana Center for Democratic Development um, and the Global Fund for uh, Community Foundation. So, so, so that's really the focus of the day is, is moving on to thinking about new ways of thinking and, and working politically. So with that, um, uh, let me introduce uh, the person who has been the driver of these two days, the, the real motivating force behind our work in thinking and working and politically at Commonics for the last close to a year, eight months. Um, uh, Jennifer Swift Morgan uh, comes out of our West Africa division, but has been acting as the, has been the, acting director of our Center for Politically Informed Programming and the driving force in our thinking and working politically uh, projects and shaping our work in that direction and has organized this fantastic event. Jen, over to you. I can't hear you. Try it again. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now?
sound check one, two. Yes, yes we can hear you. Fantastic. Yeah. I will say again that I am very happy to be here. Um, I'm welcoming all of you around the world and a nice small quality group of people here in Washington, D.C who have joined us for day two of the symposium of uh, thinking, working politically, learning, and futures. Today, as Tom said, we are moving into the future of what thinking and working politically can mean in different ways. Um, and uh, this opening session, as Tom was saying, is on politics, systems, and behaviors, and how all of these things come together. Yesterday, as Tom was saying, we heard a lot of experiences from the field. Um, about thinking and working politically, we heard a lot about the complexity of findings when you do a political economy analysis and you say you want to understand the why of what's going on, and then you start to find out, and it's really interesting a lot of the times we always say it's really interesting what's going on. Now what? Now what are we supposed to do? And this session is to try to get to that now what? When I was at USAID, maybe about seven years ago, we were working on new governance programming. We knew we needed to think and work politically. But my colleagues and I, this is in Niger, felt like there was something missing. We're like, isn't there something about social psychology or something to get at the social norms that political economy doesn't quite get on its own? And it was only recently that we started to realize, yeah, that's behavior science, right? There is there's something else going on. There's another science here that we can bring to a fore to really understand not just what's going on, but where you go from there. And so I'm really pleased for this session is going to cover that. Um, we will be talking about these applications of behavior science. Um, those of us here at Commonics, we've been working on something called actor-based change and actor-based change framework, which my colleagues Bryce and Yeta will be presenting in just a moment. This comes out of work, um, particularly from our UK colleagues and the Wood, who has been really tuned into using theory and using all these sciences to bring together to understand what's going on, but then get at that complexity. There's this idea, it's not just mosquitoes like Tom was talking about, it's the idea that every one of us has something that we refer to as goal complexity. Every one of us has multiple interests. It's rare actually to find something, someone who is just against the reform and everyone who's for it. There's, it's much more complex than that. Each of us have our own personal motivations for being here today, in addition to our professional and official reasons. And the actor-based change framework starts to get at some of that. So with no further ado, um, I am very pleased to introduce here Bryce Watson, who is from our Center for Politically Informed Programming, which is coming to a close now, but we're looking at creating and continuing work throughout sectors across the company. And Yeta Bajaziti Doli, who is our manager for monitoring, research, evaluation, and learning um, on our Western Balkans Rule of Law Initiative. And this is our project where we've really been piloting this framework we get to hear from Bryce and Yeta about the framework generally. And then we're gonna to go to a panel discussion with the chief of party of that project and two other experts in behavior, um, um, behavior economists who will start to unpack what this framework can do and applications of behavior science along with systems thinking and politics. Bryce, over to you who's in the room. I will literally hand the microphone to you. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. This is exciting. This is the first time I've stood behind a podium in like two and a half years. Um, all right, so we're gonna be going over the actor-based change framework and we have a lot to cover. So I'm just gonna dive right in. So we've talked quite a bit yesterday about this disconnection between thinking and working politically. Um, oftentimes we have a lot of great tools and we're able to use them effectively for thinking politically like applied political economy analysis, systems mapping, a variety of others. But to what extent is that learning really being connected to real decision making for the projects? Um, and oftentimes that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons, right? Um, the work plan is due within 60 days. And so it makes it very difficult. You're likely not actually finishing your research your contextual analysis before that's due. Um, you're trying to do that analysis during the chaos of startup. So in reality, you don't really have time to focus on it as a learning objective. But more broadly, even when you have time to do the PPA, oftentimes you're getting this great picture of how complex the world is, how complex the world is project. But how do you actually tie that to direct recommendations um, for your activities? Um, and that is a big, big challenge. Um, and a part of that is just because the challenges that we're trying to solve are extremely complex. And so that's why I'm gonna pass it over to Yeda to talk about that complexity. Hopefully. 
<laughs> Yet, are you able to jump on? Yes, uh, yes, ah, thank great. you, Bryce. And actually, I want to make a quick disclaimer at the very beginning. Um, well, I am based in Kosovo, uh, even though the presentation at the beginning said Philippines, I'm based in Kosovo and I'm from uh, WB Roli. Uh, we are having power cuts today in Kosovo, so my electricity keeps going on and off. I am connected to the internet through my data, but still for some reason it just keeps kicking me off. So if for some reason I disconnect, Bryce, please continue. And I really apologize about that. Uh, so to set the scene on what Bryce was just saying is that we usually find ourselves with three scenarios, the simple, complicated, and the complex scenario. The simple uh, scenario, as we can see here, is uh, like baking a cake. You have a very clear end result with a process that is process that is predictable and linear. We have no knowns, we have no unknowns. Uh, if you repeat the process multiple times, you always get the same cake, unless you make some mistake. Then there is the second situation, which is a complicated situation. It's like building a rocket. You have a clear end result with a process that has multiple casual pathways and varied uh, interventions. There will be no knowns and there will be no unknowns, but the process is still relatively uh, linear and can be repeated to get the same end result. And then we have the complex situation, which is like raising a child. The end result is entirely unclear um, and the pathway is highly complex. You have to learn as you go, change strategy and have multiple unknowns multiple unknown unknowns that you encounter throughout the way. There will be feedback loops and unpredictable environmental factors, and this, this cannot be repeated with the same result at any point. So this is the domain development or, or any kind of programming work that usually we find ourselves in. Uh, if we look at this uh, um, flock of birds, then this is a realistic representation of complexity, especially when considering a rule of law programs. We talk about complexity, we invariably talk about complex systems. You see a beautiful shape moving uh, through the sky because every individual bird, in this uh, case actor, is doing something. While each of them is doing something, they are also interacting with the other bird that is close to it, that is also doing something. And then they're all behaving and reacting to other behaviors and other forces like environmental forces, be it um, gravitational forces, magnetic fields, weather, predators, obstacles, and the similar. So this combination of individual behaviors, reactive behaviors, and environmental factors give rise to a flock in a certain shape that moves in a certain way. Uh, this understanding of complex systems is relevant to us because this is how problems tend to operate. Because problems actually emerge from complex systems of people doing things, interacting with each other, and then reacting to our environment. And so complexity is this combination of individual reactive behaviors and reaction to our environment. In a really complex setting, we are dealing with complex behavioral systems. And we are also trying to create change in these systems through programming. Effectively, uh, when entering a system, you're hoping to inject a small to medium amount of change with target groups and then see this cascade across the, the system in terms of secondary change, tertiary change, and so on. But they are never in isolation. You have other actors working in the same system, and you have to hope that you are moving the system in a complementary way rather than uh, in a way that disrupts it. And we always have to remember that we are working with people who are fundamentally the most unpredictable creatures. And then you take all of this into account and hopefully this changes the shape of the system. This all starts to feel incredibly stressful as there is so much going on at once, which is why we need a complex intervention and tools that respond, respond to complexity and work with it rather than shoehorning things into something that doesn't really fit. All right, I hope you're all following our analogies from mosquitoes to birds. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the actor-based change framework is a step-by-step -step process to try and deal with all of that chaos, right? And the first step is to map out your problem, try to get a good understanding of what problem are we actually focused on? What are the consequences of that problem? And what are the many different causes of that given challenge? And then you wanna map your actors that are related to that problem. Um, and this should be both common and uncommon actors, people that you might not necessarily consider um, when you generally think of kind of your traditional actors. Then when you get all of those actors, you wanna map them out and start to think, how do they influence one another and how much influence do they have? And when we talk about influence, it's 
when one actor wants to change the behavior of another, how often are they actually able to do that? Is it all the time? Is it some of the time? Is it realistically almost uh, none of the time? And you wanna choose one of those actors that has significant influence across the entire system. Because if you can change the behavior of that actor, then you can start to see those knock-on effects that Yeda was talking about. So once you've chosen your entry point for that actor, you wanna figure out what is the behavior that they're doing right now and what behavior do we want them to be doing in the future and how can we potentially change that? In this very silly example, we'll be going over drinking tea. Um, and then once you've identified the behavior, then you can use the COM-B model, um, capacity, opportunity, and motivation to be able to map out what that behavior looks like. And Yeda is going to be getting into more detail what that looks like in practicality. Then you can figure out, okay, what of those different things to potentially change their behavior do we as a project actually have the ability to impact? And that is when you start putting together your useful theory of change, which again, we're gonna be getting into more detail. Importantly, and a bit of an innovation with the Western Balkans Roli team um, is how to integrate this with thinking and working politically. And so we actually conducted an APEA ahead of this whole process with the Western Balkans team. And that PEA input um, went into our problem analysis, went into mapping all the different common and uncommon actors, as well as mapping out our behavior on opportunity and motivation of the actors themselves. Um, and then interestingly, we also added strategic foresight when we started putting together that useful theory of change to think through how can we make it robust against the worst possible uh, scenario that could happen. And importantly, we haven't mentioned this, it's extremely participatory. So you do this whole process with the donors in the room, with your local and international um, ca counterparts and partners um, to try and get everybody on the same page and make sure you're getting all of that knowledge um, or as much of it as you can in the room. All right, I've already talked through the problem and we have a lot of slides, so I'm just gonna basically skip over this, but this is your first step. And then this is the mapping. And as I mentioned, you wanna try and find one actor that can then, once they've changed their behavior, influence others who then influence others down uh, the road. And then once you've identified that actor, identifying what um, behavior you wanna change and figuring out how to change it. So the more complex part is the COM-B model and that's where I'll pass it over to you to talk it through. Thank you, Bryce. Then looking at the COM-B uh, model, it's basically for those unfamiliar to it is from the work of Susan Mitchell. And the whole idea is that behavior can be understood as a combination of three aspects, capability, motivation, and opportunity. What these are breaks down further, but in fact, capability is your individual ability to do something. Opportunity is your environmental uh, enabling factors, and motivation is your internal will and desires. This all each breaks into, like for example, capabilities, psychological and physical, opportunity into social and physical, and then motivation is automatic versus also reflective. Uh, but uh, for the sake of time, I'll be passing uh, those details. Uh, once you have identified the behavior and the component reasons for its existence, you need to then use these three, to shift the behavior onto a new behavior. You need to see how you can impact the new, uh, the, to sh shift the behavior to the new behavior through changing the capability, opportunity, and motivation. For example, the example uh, Bryce very quickly mentioned, drinking tea. If I'm not drinking tea and you want me to be drinking tea, then you can use this model to understand why I'm not drinking tea and how to support me to actually drink it. So suppose my current behavior is not drinking tea. Uh, and as I was saying, you want me to drink, Tea, because this is a positive British habit. Um, first, you must understand why I'm not drinking tea. Uh, once identified, you can understand how to change my behavior, giving me the knowledge and skills, which is the capabilities, uh, to drink tea, and or physical access to things like cattle um, and tea bags, etc., to or uh, break the social taboos of not drinking tea if there is one, uh, and or break some social stigma, as I'm saying, and or help me see the value of drinking it, which would be my motivation. So remember, uh, so in terms, in order to get me to drink tea, we need to see what we can actually change and what we cannot change, because maybe it's not a matter of um, capability because I know how to make tea, and maybe it's not a matter of motivation because I would like to drink tea, but um, there is like the cultural, there's, it's a culture of tea and coffee drinking. Uh, um, so in this thing, thing, uh, case also the opportunity would be cultural tea and uh, coffee drinking. But very often in this mix, we have also a lot of things, uh, some assumptions that we cannot change. Um, and we have to be aware of them. We have to identify very early on. And through this model, we identify assumptions at each level. 
um, and then we will be able to work within the system considering these assumptions and taking them that they are part of the system. If we change, yes, thank you. Uh, this can be, uh, but let's say that we identify how exactly we can change my behavior, but then we realize that we don't have an end because uh, then you might not be able to shift my behavior in a meaningful way. This is where the cold course comes in. And you need, we need to find also who else have the conversations, who else is in this field and who else uh, could be uh, part of the process to change my behavior. So basically identifying partners in this case. Let's suppose that we found a meaningful end and we found a behavior change we can affect with the intervention and that the actors affect the system if necessary. And we know what the problem is so we can translate that into a sustainable positive change. For those unfamiliar, uh, so this case, we, we move the, that knowledge into the useful theory of change. For those of them unfamiliar to the useful theory of change, uh, the very bottom level is the activities. Activities represent pre preliminary activities. For example, if we want to do an analysis on something or a curricular development, etc., cetera, it's task we perform in order to be able to deliver. And then the next level up is goods and services provided. These are the products we provide to the stakeholders, actors, beneficiaries, whom you want to reach, and then they want them to react to those goods and services. And then one more level up is the capability, opportunity, and motivation changes. So basically those changes that you want to, to, to have in order to change behavior, which in this case then is the higher level up. Uh, and then that would lead to the direct benefits. So in the tea drinking example, my behavior, we let's say we want to change my behavior uh, to drink tea. Uh, we do this by, let's say, um, change, making me see the benefits of, let's say, for example, making me see the benefits of drinking tea, then this changes behavior, then this has the right benefits of uh, drinking tea. Uh, the which is uh, expected to contribute to the overall sustainable positive change. Once we identify the calm, uh, so the capability, opportunity, and motivation, we slot this into the theory of change with a little bit of thought and with assumptions that we already mentioned. The activities and goods and services are more easily defined uh, to what we actually need to see happening. And then reach is predefined by the ABC, um, after base change approach, and then the reaction relative, uh, can be relatively straightforward. In this case, the direct benefits um, and the sustainable positive change could also be defined by the ABC. All right, so we only have a few more slides, so I'm going to run through these. Um, just another quick overview of what we just went through. So you map your problem, you map the actors related to that problem, you identify an entry point based on their influence, you map their behavior and how you might be able to change it, and then that, those activities then turn into your useful theory of change. One innovation that we added to this was strategic foresight. At the end, we looked at what is the best possible case scenario in the for the project? What kind of potential contextual shifts are there? What's the worst possible scenario? And then how do we make that strategy robust against that worst case scenario? Or how do we monitor those potential shifts so that way we can create contingency plans if needed? And then lastly, importantly, as you're going through this, we said it was very participatory. You wanna be asking yourself, is the thing that I just said about the problem or the actor um, actually evidenced? So we have a report, for instance, that says this. Is it a justifiable belief? So we've experienced it many times. We know it's absolutely true. Or is it just an opinion? And when you mark all of those opinions, you find that there's oftentimes a really important opinion that you need to validate before you necessarily know if what your activity is going to work or not. And that um, list of questions can then feed into your ongoing political analysis. Um, so this is actually how we ended up des designing a rapid PEA um, following this process with the Western Balkans team. All right, um, I think we're running pretty late. Okay, so perfect. So we'll uh, take three minutes for questions. I'll pass it to Renee online to okay. see if there's anything uh, there. Yes, hi, Brice, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. That's so great. Yeah, we've got a really great chat uh, going on. So I'll just uh, feed out some of the there's comments and some questions and points. A really interesting point, I think many of the online participants uh, can appreciate, which is about choosing the right champion who does have influence is a key issue. So we want to choose the right champion who does have influence. However, many champions, you know, they might have high interest, they might be very interested to support the project to align and have, you know, mutual aims, etc. 
but they just don't have the right amount of influence. So high interest, but not such you know high influence. What do you, what, any comments on that, uh, Yetzer Bryce? Yeah, that's a really good point. I'll just quickly mention something and pass it to Yeda, um, which is this happened actually quite a bit. We did four workshops uh, across three countries uh, at the Western Balkans team. We had some actors that we thought, oh, we, we could actually really work with them. We have good relationships. But at the end of the day, they're not really going to be able to influence the system in a substantial way. And so one option would be to say, OK, they're actually not the right people to work with. Um, the other is to say, well, how do we build their influence? Who else in the system are they connected to that we might be able to further network them? So that way, in a year from now, they actually do have substantial influence. So that way we can continue to work with them, given that we know that they have a lot of buy-in. But um, yeah, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Very, sh very shortly, basically what Bryce said, but then also from everyday experience, we are also noticing that sometimes you also start with a, an actor that you think they have really strong influence and all the data shows that they have really strong influence, but then down the line, you actually realize someone else influences them, but you don't have access to that someone else who influences them. So because of this, we have to be in constant lookout to see, are you working with the influencers and how can you support them to strengthen their, their their uh, role in their influence. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions in the room? Yeah, for us, um, we also could be a, that the problem we have specifically on the influential people is we haven't reached to them at the PEA stage. Um, well, essentially, all we do is dedicate all our resources to such in building those relationships. Sometimes, as you say, timelines just don't add up, right? Um, you're meant to deliver the PA by a certain date, and you just started building those relationships. So, I think for us, one of one of the main things that we really focus on, free if we can, or during the PA, is use it as an excuse to get to the people we want to get, even if that takes us longer, even if it takes us into routes that we or are not desired. Like so far, we've had some flexibility on on that, but it's really we found that really challenging, but unless we get the right people in the quite early on, otherwise we just don't get what we need at the end of the process, if that makes sense. So it's just worth for us to like dedicate that amount of time. Um, yeah. Ray points. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that is one thing that we've learned throughout this entire, like some of the research that we've done around our PEA as well, is like one of the greatest benefits of doing a PEA is those relationships that you build through those conversations rather than necessarily that you're actually getting. But to your point about finding the right actors, I mean, it's so, so difficult. One way we've done it in the past is just to make sure you're using the snowballing method as you're interviewing people. So asking them, you know, who do you go to for information? Like, who do you go to to try and influence X, Y, and Z? And then you can start to narrow down that group that actually does have some influence, but you know, there's no perfect method. It's um, a great point. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap up the Q&A. We'll try to jump into the chat and answer any other questions as well. But now, excitingly, we get to go to our panel um, of phenomenal experts. Um, so we have Chris Marshall, who's the team leader of the FCDO Western Balkans Rule of Law Initiative, uh, focused on organized crime. We also have Laura Van Berkel, uh, the behavioral economist at USAID Center for Economic Development. Um, and then we also have Laura uh, Kojukaru, uh, which hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, at Ideas42. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, just wanted to make sure it, all the panelists, are you able to join? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Perfect. All right, great. So this panel is really going to be focused on um, behavior change models and how we might be find that with the politically um, and specifically that systems thinking mindset versus more of an individually based behavior change mindset. Um, so the first question I want to bring over to you, Chris, um, what has been the experience of the uh, Western Balkans Roli really team applying the ABC approach? Um, specifically the benefits and the value add in comparison to the way you had been doing um, or had planned to be doing programming previously. Thanks, Bryce. I mean, I think as, as you and Yetra have mentioned during the course of the presentation, it really delivered very significant value to us. I think one of the first things that stood out was 
it was a great way of just going back to some of the questions people have raised of identifying those champions, identifying really the level of influence that there was across all of the stakeholders that we had within our systems. And for us, working across six countries in the Western Balkans, we have a very, very high level of complexity. We have a lot of political complexity and we have a very agile area that we're working on in terms of combating serious organized crime and corruption. So I think firstly, what this gave us was that really good sense of the value of entry points. I think the second thing that came through from the process was actually, it was really important to get all of the project stakeholders in the room. And when we were doing our active-based change framework workshops, we brought in FCDO for that, but we also brought in other donors and other key international stakeholders as well. And I think what that gave us was firstly an ability to, to influence some of the other project influence, implementers in the country, but it also gave us that real richness of experience and it's enabled us to build a really good consensus with FCDO over what we should be doing and why we would be doing it. And I think that was especially important when it came to the choice we made on entry points, because it meant that we didn't have to go back to FCDO as the client and say, well, the reason for doing a, this is that, because actually they were there as part of the process. And I think the other thing that was really valuable for us was it enabled us to convene our key partners and experts as well. And it gave that real unity of vision and built those internal relationships. The other element that came through, and as Bryce mentioned, we did four activate change workshops over a relatively short period of time, but it was something that we could do on our own timing. So it wasn't like the APA where actually you've got deadlines to do it within the very, very early stages of the project where you're starting off. Instead, what we could do with the ABC workshops is we could think, let's consciously do it a little bit further down the line, and let's make sure that we're actually building up a good level of knowledge first. And it was a really good lens for us to sort of rethink some of the areas where we were going to work. And I think a particularly good example of this was our plans in Bosnia-Herzegovina. In Bosnia, we were initially thinking of working across a number of cantons. And what the ABC workshops gave us was that just that real reality check to say, yes, we could be doing that, but actually if we work and have these entry points in five or six different locations, probably it's only in one of those where we're really going to get traction. So it was almost like that cold water hose to go, you may have the enthusiasm to go into these different places, but actually here's just a very practical way forward and a very practical way of doing things. Fantastic. Yeah, I love that point, especially about the um, building relationships and buy-in too. I remember one particular donor in one of our workshops said, man, I was really dreading this workshop. I have been in so many of these, they're normally a waste of time. And he was like, this was the most useful workshop I've ever been a part of. Um, so I, it's such a great point, Chris. Um, now I wanna pass it over to Laura and Laura um, for a fairly long question. But in general, how does applying a behavior change approach differ from a more traditional non-behavior change approach um, to development programming? And how do you define behavior change approaches in general and specifically kind of getting beyond just that um, social behavior change communications they focus on and more about behavior change more generally. Would you like to get started, Laura, or should I get started? Um, I can start, I guess, and then I'll turn it over to you. So I'll try to try to keep it short so that you have plenty of time to, to address the question as well. So, um, so for me, I define behavioral science um, broadly as a research-based approach to understand how and why people behave the way they do in real world environments. And so traditional approaches uh, to development programming tend to uh, follow this neoclassical economics view of behavior that people make decisions and behave in ways that provide them with the greatest personal benefit or satisfaction. And programs are designed with this in mind, that we assume often that if we just give people knowledge, they will apply it. If we train them, then they're gonna take action. If they have awareness, then their behavior is gonna change. And that's unfortunately not always the case. Experimental evidence from behavioral economics shows that humans act in systematic and predictable ways that deviate from this traditional view. Um, so for example, we may not apply knowledge from a training because we have difficulty paying attention, or maybe we return to the office and we face pressure from our colleagues 
to revert to the status quo way of doing things. And so um, I'm going to paraphrase USAID's uh, new chief economist, Dean Carlin, in uh, his remarks that the goal of a behavioral change approach of behavioral economics is often to make it easier for people to make decisions and to act in ways that they would want to you know, think and act in a moment of uh, deep reflection and full information. So we try to predict how people behave in the real world and then design programs and activities to account for this behavior. So sometimes that does mean social and behavioral change communications activities. It means providing information in ways that resonates with people and captures their attention, but it can mean other types of interventions as well. Um, and I'll also just say that behavioral science differs from traditional approaches in another way, and that behavioral science tends to focus on outcomes over outputs. So traditional approaches can focus a lot on outputs, the number of people trained, the number of organizations assisted, the number of new laws created. And in behavior change approaches, we really want to focus on how people behave as the outcome of interest. So instead of measuring progress, for example, in the number of women trained to run for office, we really are concerned with how many women actually run. So it really emphasizes administrator powers idea of um, progress beyond programs. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Laura for her uh, thoughts on this as well. Thank you so much. I will probably just mirror a lot of what Laura said. Um, so first of all, let me start by saying that at least our um, view on this is that development interventions often fail or they are not as effective as we expect them to be because they simply rely on unrealistic assumptions or expectations about humans and human behavior. And programs that could be benefit, benefiting their targets often suffer from low take up, drop out, ineffective use of resources and so on. Often because of this reason, they overlook these basic insights about human nature. And ultimately, no matter how available or effective a drug, a vaccine, a product or program might be, they will not achieve much if the people who need them and who could benefit from these do not request them or do not make proper use of them. What behavioral science can help us have is a more realistic understanding of human behavior, one that stems from this recognition that human decisions are not rooted usually or often into well thought out cost benefit analysis, and that even when we do make the right decision, we don't necessarily follow through on those decisions. This is what we typically refer to as an intention action gap. Behavioral science is trying to understand how human psychology and the context, importantly, in which people operate, affect our decisions and our actions. So in terms of the role that behavioral science can play for behavioral ch behavior change, well, first of all, I believe that behavioral science can offer a different lens to identify opportunity areas or problems, and also for diagnosing the challenges, what we usually call behavioral barriers. The typical go-to explanations are things such as, well, they don't understand that vaccines are good for them, and these are oftentimes valid and they can be relevant. But it could also be that what the behavioral barrier is or what the problem truly is, is that people don't get around to scheduling an appointment if we are talking about vaccination, or perhaps they wrongly believe that nobody else is getting vaccinated. A good understanding of the true issue and of its potential causes can allow us to design more effective solutions and to avoid wasting our limited resources on attempting to address some irrelevant aspects. And second, I think behavioral science is also a good tool for designing solutions. Once you understand what aspects of human psychology and what contextual factors are contributing to a behavior, it's much easier to better tailor your solutions. This can range from simple changes in the environment. For example, you could remove hassles or you could send reminders to attempting to change mental models or more difficult tasks such as changing social norms. And while the methods that we typically use to design solutions, they do borrow from human-centered design or participatory design and other areas, what makes them stand apart is that they are targeted at addressing specific barriers that we previously identified through research 
as opposed to just attempting to see if something that is off the shelf might work. And mirroring what Laura was saying earlier, while communications might be one of the channels used, is not the only one, and not nor is it the most important one that uh, we have to use. In contrast to most to the more traditional approaches, we also tend to focus more on the context. We tend to change the context often perhaps by simplifying it or by removing frictions, as opposed to trying to change the individual. Um, and what I also believe that is a bit different with behavioral science is that it brings in more structure and more methodological rigor, which helps oftentimes um, to avoid falling prey to our intuition, gut feeling, or some sort of idealized um, economic models of behavior. And also testing is embedded in our approach, which leads to more accountability, I believe. That's it, thank you. Fantastic, yeah, thanks so much for that great overview. Um, I think we can all empathize with that intention action gap. Um, and I love the the kind of general idea of let's treat people as they actually are and not you know, hope they would be. Um, and you actually bridged the next question pretty well when talking about context. So um, we wanna talk a little bit about how to connect these uh, principles of systems thinking and thinking and working politically with a behavior change approach. So I'll, I'll pass it over to Chris. Um, in what concrete ways can AP integrated with behavior change analysis, um, as well as other forms of TWP? So I think one of the ways that we looked to integrate things was firstly around the, the sequencing. So looking particularly at our work in Kosovo, we had a, a very heavy focus on the applied political economy analysis first, and making sure through that, and just picking up some of the questions in the chat here, that, that we were looking not just at those questions of champions, but also those questions of spoilers as well, and, and really understanding who was able to play what in uh, what role in terms of the, the change that we wanted to see in each of our program countries. What we did then was make sure that not just the people who had led uh, the APA, but also the sort of subject matter of the APA was interrogated as a next stage. And we did that by our own check-ins with national stakeholders. Uh, we did it through our own work with the donor and really understanding what other programs they were running and the lessons that we could learn from that. And then finally, that's when we <clears throat> took it through to, to look at the, the actor-based change framework. And I think for us, what we've really looked to do is to understand how all of our stakeholders interrelate with one another. And it's something that we've kept in mind right the way through the program design and through the program implementation as well. I think as Yetta mentioned, one of the things that we look to do is see our program managers, but also our Mel team as that central hub and repository so that we're doing a regular pause and reflect. And that's one of the things that Yetta was actually leading for us at the start of today uh, for Kosovo and making sure that we're actually cross-referencing all of the interventions that we're delivering in each of our program countries so that we're continually thinking how are our core stakeholders behaving what are some of the motivations that are shaping that behavior and actually as well making sure that we're going back to our theory of change because i think the other thing that we've really tried to do as a program and what we would see at the heart of our approach to thinking and working politically is differing from the usual theory of change approach. So we focus on the useful theory of change as yes, we were talking about at the start. And what we also try to do is to make sure that we integrate that into all of our project discussions so that time and time again, we're going through and thinking when it comes down to capabilities, when it comes down to opportunities, when it comes down to motivations and the question that you were talking about earlier in terms of how do you get people to drink tea, that's actually at the heart of all of our project discussions. Yeah, that's a great point and really helps you kind of map out all those assumptions that you need testing throughout the uh, the activity. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Laura on your thoughts as well about the same question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I think Chris uh, covered a lot of great points, especially in thinking through the, the sequencing of, of political economy analysis and uh, behavioral change approaches like the ABC uh, framework. And I think that behavioral science has a lot to to uh, contribute to applied political economy analysis, but behavior change approaches also benefit from political economy analysis and thinking and working politically. Um, so, you know, behavior is heavily influenced by context 
and by culture. And as Laura kind of mentioned, the environment, it's not about just trying to change the individual, but it's trying to change the context in which they're making decisions and operating. And so it is really important to understand the political economy that people are operating in, the systems that they're working with. So what drives my behavior in the United States is very different than what drives somebody's behavior in Malawi, for example. We have different you know, values, practices, histories, um, you know, many other, other differences. And so for behavior change to be successful, you do need to understand the relevant stakeholders, the foundational factors, and, you know, the here and now that could impact behavior as, as you kind of alluded to, Bryson, doing that scenario planning and thinking through what might, you know, uh, cause a problem with our intervention and how might we need to adapt because behavior is dynamic. And um, so, for example, one intervention that's been really successful in the United States in increasing voter turnout is sending people postcards with their voting history and kind of thanking them for voting in the past. Um, in some cases, it's compared with your neighbor's history of voting to show that maybe you're not living up to your civic duty compared with other people. But as uh, the, the organization Democracy International noted in their research on voter turnout in Tunisia, this type of behavioral intervention is inappropriate in an author post authoritarian context, where if you get a postcard that says, you know, thank you for voting and here's how your neighbors vote have voted in the past, not necessarily who they voted for, but even just that monitoring of behavior can undermine trust in ballot secrecy or recall um, surveillance by the state and by secret police. And so you really do have to take that history and that foundational context into mind. We can't just apply a behavioral intervention that worked somewhere in one country and just plop it down somewhere else. You do need to understand, um, you know, as I said, the, the political economy of the, the context that you're in. And then um, I, I realize I'm running short on time. So I'll just say quickly, I think that applied political economy analysis does already integrate behavior change in a lot of ways, at least theoretically, if not in practice, looking at rules of the games and norms. Um, but behavioral science can help dig a little bit deeper and not just identifying what the norm is, but you know, diving into who is driving the norm, what sanctions are people facing if they um, violate the norm, what rewards are they getting formally or informally if they uphold it, and you know, where are the potential levers for, for changing the, the norm or other issues that are, are driving and shaping behavior. Fantastic. Yeah, those are some great examples of how these things can really come together. Um, I did want to now bring it over to Laura to see um, your thoughts on, you know, are there any tensions between these two approaches, between systems thinking and a more individually based behavior change approach? Thank you for sure. So I do believe that there is some tension between these two approaches. And I think from the papers that you all probably have seen, um, this issue is getting more attention from both practitioners and academics. Um, that could possibly be due because behavioral economics and behavioral science have been getting more and more attention in these past decades already. And even though they are not widely used by all organizations, they are seen by, as a, by many as a helpful tool. So this focus and knowledge on how to change individual behavior, which is how behavioral science and behavioral economics are vastly perceived at this point, is seen by some as coming at the expense of systemic change. And some of the most compelling arguments are related to the fact that um, if you overemphasize individual change, um, you may crowd out support and resources for, for those uh, more system, systemic changes. And you might also shift the social responsibility from governments and corporations to individuals. I do believe that this tension only exists if the two approaches are seen as alternatives rather than complements. And I must admit that it is clear that focusing on, for example, only on individual level change cannot solve all of our world's problems. At best, is not the most direct or the most effective approach. And you can easily think of issues such as climate change, inequality, poverty, and so on, where individual change is not sufficient to bring about meaningful improvements. And what is more, in doing so or in trying to do so, individuals are that and 
those are particularly the ones that are the least powerful in most cases, um, end up being the ones being held account accountable or burdened even further. And that's something that we definitely do not want to do. But on the other hand, an exclusive focus on system level approaches can also fall short uh, because if you ignore insights about individual psychologies, it can lead to policies that fail to achieve the desired effects or might even backfire. And second, it's not always possible clearly to, to resort to these systemic changes because not everything can and should be legislated or institutionalized. And if you think, for example, about healthcare decisions, yes, making healthcare, healthcare available and accessible does require systemic change, but the decision in the end to access that healthcare belongs to the individuals. And in a democratic system, it would be difficult and wrong to legislate or enforce people to get health checks or adhere to their medication and so on. So you can also look at this from a different angle. And that is the fact that systems are made of smaller parts and they often rely on people. For example, people are the ones that need to execute and implement policies. And as people, as humans, they are susceptible to the same failures and biases and everyone else. So these last mile type of issues are more suited to a more individual behavior change approach. You can also think about gathering support for systemic change, which might uh, need, uh, might require to change individuals' perspectives or the narratives around a specific issue. And that is more um, in the realm of individual level change. But as practitioners that work typically on either or uh, one of these um, approaches, it can be difficult sometimes to recognize when our approach is not the best or is not sufficient. Because as you know, when you have a hammer, everything does look like a nail. And even when we do see that maybe it's not the most appropriate one, because for example, in behavioral science, we are prompted to think about structural issues and we, are, we, we do think about the importance of context, but oftentimes we are in a position where we cannot change much. So we just try to do the best we can with what we have, which might end up sometimes with band-aid type of solutions. So as behavioral science is becoming less and less synonymous with individual change, I think um, many organizations are currently working on integrating behavioral science and more systemic changes. I think they are both necessary, necessary and they can enhance each other when applied appropriately. But as development professionals, we all need to be trained to recognize when an issue should be addressed from an individual or systemic perspective, and more importantly, how and when the two approaches could be used in tandem. And I could probably come up with examples of how this is currently being done here and there, uh, or how even our own organization is trying to look into these issues more deeply, but I think we are out of time. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and love that point about it's not all one or the other, right? It's about, about which which circumstances. Um, I'm going to skip down a little bit, just given the time, um, and close us out to a question to the entire panel, um, which is, do you have any advice for projects or other reform programs um, that may see value in adopting this kind of systems thinking behavior change approach, but don't have any experience doing it yet? Um, how can they get started? Um, any other tips or tricks that you've learned kind of throughout your own experience? Don't all jump in at once. Okay, maybe let me go for it first. Uh, so, I mean, obviously I would say that, that one of the critical things is thinking about who you've got on the team. Um, for us, what's been absolutely critical in being able to do this well is making sure that we've got that combination of local and international knowledge when it comes to our MEL approach. So having Yetta as the sort of the hub of our MEL team, but also then being able to bring in uh, international expertise in the form of UK divisions, MEL lead, Nikki Wood, I think has been really helpful in terms of giving that sort of creative tension and also enabling us to have a MEL team that brainstorms and thinks about creative and different approaches. The other thing that I think has been really important for us is, is making sure you get engagement from the client, whether it's FCDO or USAID at a very early stage. 
because making sure that you've got um, a donor that's willing to walk with you on this process is going to make all the difference. And the understanding that we have with FCDO and Home Office on this program is that we're specifically set up to be agile, we're specifically set up to, to try new things and to take risks. And I think that gives us an explicit mandate to deploy new and different tools and to really think in creative ways. I think the other takeaway that I would recommend is to make sure that you, you're open-minded and that you create a new hire across your team so that you have people who actually want to try and experiment with these new approaches. We've deliberately gone for a team that see challenge, uncertainty, and agility as positive things. And I think that's really paid dividends in terms of looking at that combination of different approaches. Such a good point about bringing on the right team that, that's comfortable with that flexibility. Absolutely. Laura or uh, Laura? Yeah, so I think I'll just, um, you know, echo a lot of Chris's advice. So sign on to, to everything that he said. But I'll also say that I do think it's um, important to spend uh, time investing in the early stages of the process and really thinking clearly about what the behaviors are that you want to change, what the um, the capabilities, opportunities, and motivations are that are driving that behavior, and you know, really think through and devote time to that process and don't just jump to solutions as it can often be be tempting to do. As, you know, Tom mentioned in his uh, opening remarks here, you know, you have to ask the right question if you want to get quality information. Your, your data is only as good as the information that you put into it. And it's the same thing with behavior change. You're only going to change behavior if you have a clear idea of what the behavior is that you're you're trying to achieve. Um, so that's uh, one thing from, from my advice. And then also to, um, to echo Laura's comments on the previous question, I think it's also important to be clear about what behavior change can and cannot do. So it's not a tool that's supposed to be used for everything. It's, it's valuable in some situations, but, but not others. And just Great. to repeat that and to quote one of my colleagues, let the problem drive the method and the solution and not the other way around. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I cannot stress enough what Laura said about the importance of defining your problem and or your opportunity properly and deciding what the solution would be uh, at the, at the uh, initial stages. But also what I want to maybe say from our own ex experience is that it is extremely important, and this has been said throughout the day, it is extremely important to build champions and not, not just one, not only internally, but also with your partners and to, to have some level of expertise, not only in your team, but also in other people that you might be uh, partnering with, because if they don't understand exactly why you're doing what you're doing, they will often feel frustrated that you are taking too long or they already know what the solution should be and so on. So it's important to bring them on board early on and at least they would understand why you're doing what you're doing and what your approach is. Um, so yeah, I think this early buy-in from all the relevant stakeholders, I, I think it's one of the most important ones for, for success. Such a good point and a common theme across our two days so far. Um, great, so now we're gonna open it up to the Q&A. Um, I will see if Renee has any questions from the chat first. Yes, hi Bryce, uh, the chat is on fire. So um, what's great <laughs> is uh, the panelists have, uh, I think they've been reviewing uh, some of these comments and questions as they've been going along. Um, Chris, I know you mentioned that you would be happy to address Peter's question, which others also are, are you know, adding to it. And it, it's this point, um, I think we all can relate to how we mitigate against local actors, um, you know, the challenge around speaking your mind when there's donors in the room or other authorities in the room, and also that these donors or these authorities might impose their bias. So, you know, people might be uh, less inclined to speak what they really want to say. Any thoughts on that from the panel? And I know Chris said he would give it a go. Yeah, sure. Happy to start with that. So I think we've been really conscious that everyone 
who's part of the process is, is inevitably going to bring their own bias. And so what we try to do when we were designing the ABC processes is really to think about what those biases were and to think about how we created a, 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 bias, you know, a mix of approaches and viewpoints that were not just in the room, but part of the broader process. And as we were designing the ABC process, we felt that actually there were different stages where it was appropriate to bring in different groups of people. So we made sure that as a program team that we were doing a lot of engagement with our national stakeholders actually outside the room. And so we did some very conscious prior engagement to make sure that we were getting the understanding of the range of influences. We were getting the understanding of who felt especially connected in good or bad ways with other individuals, but also with other structures within the system. And we also made sure that we were bringing in a range of different and potentially competing perspectives. And we encouraged that debate to come out through the workshops. And we structured the workshops by using different small groups so that actually what we were able to do is to manage who was within what group, who was looking at which particular issue so that we could actually give everyone a space to talk and we could then come together as a plenary and using Bryce, Nikki and Yetta as our facilitators to challenge and maybe dig into some of those views a bit better. The next step that we did though is after we'd done those in-person workshops, we actually then went out and conducted a follow-on set of validations. And those validations drew on some people who we knew had really, really strong views. And so we used them almost as a, a testing ground to look at what we'd concluded, some of the assumptions we'd made and to make sure that those were correct. But it also then gave us the luxury of, of sitting down with the national stakeholders and saying, this is where we started off with you. This is the follow on process that we've gone through. This is what we're doing. We're coming back to you now. And that threw up some, some really interesting insights and things that they hadn't necessarily thought about. And it also enabled them to see, OK, you've invested a very, very significant amount of time in thinking through and doing this well. And actually, we see that this program is adopting a different approach, and that's an approach we can feel comfortable buying into. Great. Thanks, Chris. Oh, sorry, Bryce. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to see if Laura or Laura had any thoughts on the question as well. If not, we can jump to the next question, too. Silence. Okay. Um, this is a comment, but there's a few comments following Stephanie Molina. Um, when and again, probably something some of us are familiar with this uh, terminology between winners and losers, champions, non-reformers, reformers, etc. So the point is, is that we often, you know, focus on the champions and and who will support our reform, who will support our work, and and maybe look to ignoring um, those who are non-reformers. And the word here is uh, losers. And so I think the question, or at least the comment, is trying to get at you know, what do we need to take into account to, mini to mitigate or minimize the non-reformers who might feel, you know, they're going to lose out on something here, you know, they're going to maybe even create more opposition. Um, how, how, how do we mitigate that? And I, I see Laura shaking her head online. I don't know if Bryce could see that, but yeah. Anyway, there's a few nods. So, you know, I'm sure we're all aware of this. Yeah, it's nodding along in a agreement with the, the question, because I think it's an important um, consideration is that, you know, as, as others have mentioned, it's a dynamic system. And if you change the behavior of, of one actor, others might, you know, follow suit, they might be motivated, they might, you know, follow along in your change, but others, as you, you mentioned, are going to potentially lose out or, or experience resistance. And I think, first, it's important to understand um, you know, in the same way that we understand what might motivate people to act, we need to understand what might motivate or or otherwise drive people to resist. And that can be really explicit incentives, like they're going to lose money or other things, you know, explicit, clear losses, but can also include some psychological drivers as well. So for example, people do tend to experience losses uh, more deeply than they experience gains. And people also have a tendency to just prefer the status quo that, you know, that change in and of itself can encounter some psychological resistance. And so I think it's important to, to think things through from a, a behavioral change perspective and think through what, 
might drive resistance at you know the the psychological level, at the systemic level, at the the social level. Are they going to encounter um, you know pressure from their their networks to adhere to an existing norm, et cetera? And then you can tailor the um, how you're going to respond to that potential resistance uh, in the the best way possible. Yep. One question in the room. <laughs> it's building on, on Laura's point. Um, so from the work we do, and I'm going to talk specifically, like we work with politicians, political institutions, representative institutions um, for global partners governance. Um, when it could actually, just talking about change can be incredibly patronizing. And we rarely, well, I, would, I don't think we say that. <laughs> Um, specifically with politicians just, just coming in and sort of implying that whatever it is that they're doing it's changing is just the wrong way to start. Um, so what we talk about instead of behavioral change, which is what we mean, is more about working with them, right? We are at their service. We're trying to understand what their incentives are, what's exactly blocking that change, right? It's specifically like Lara was mentioning here, because um, we're nobody to question their method, but actually we may have some insights or some time or some dedication to support whatever it is that they are willing to do or trying to do in their context. So I wonder if the speakers or the panelists could talk about experiences where they had to frame this differently because for us, like just the framing of the support of the intervention is gonna determine a lot of the work. And so we are a small organization and we, we have to partner, for example, to access USAID funding, that becomes a challenge when we are not priming, right? Because obviously different organizations speak in different terms and what, it, what was different before used to talk a lot about changing institutional behavior and would, you know, go into a country and talk about that. And we found that incredibly challenging to build relationships. So I just wondered if others had examples. Not exactly the same thing, but I was trying to write in the chat that in terms of the language and the wording that we use, we our methodology internally, we call the first step problem definition, but we are trying to move away from this terminology when talking with external partners and call it more opportunity identification because people seem to react poorly and um, probably is not even the, the most exact definition to say that it's a problem. Sometimes it's just improving something. Uh, but for the same reasons, we are trying to not call it a problem because people feel like it's patronizing and they actually do not have any problem for you to solve. Any other questions in the room? All right, and maybe one last question in the chat, Renee. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, and by the way, there was a correction there. It was uh, not Stephanie, it was Stephen from USAID. Um, so that's the point. Uh, sorry, just let me scroll because I thought we were uh, done. There is this point um, that is being made around um, ethnicity. Uh, so for example, in the Balkans and Kosovo in particular, um, you know, ethnicity was crucial and as well political will. Uh, for example, they give the example to motivate Serbs living in Kosovo to participate uh, in Belgrade's lead. Um, there was a question, what is the current state in Kosovo these days? I don't know if um, someone was able to answer that. But then uh, someone else speaks about this in relation to uh, Nigeria, where they are. And they also have these complexities of norms, religion, ethnicity, and godfatherism in our political systems. How The question, how do we go about mitigating all this to having rightful stakeholders and influencers? Very big question. So I think very quickly on that, because I know we're, we're quite short of time, but one of the things we've seen is just an incredible complexity within our stakeholders. I think we'd gone into, um, for instance, the ABC workshops with certain assumptions around what ethnicity might mean. and as we started to, to work on and deliver the project and interact with the stakeholders, what we've seen is that some of our initial thinking is just, it's not as simple. Um, we're seeing a number of our key stakeholders have a very 
nuanced and very complex position when it comes to working with different ethnic groups in Kosovo, and also a very complex position when it comes to working across the region. So for us as a regional project, we do have that relationship with Belgrade as well. We do likewise have the relationships within Bosnia Herzegovina. And so one of the things that we're continually trying to do with our stakeholders is make sure that we create that relationship of trust. And I think trust is probably the fundamental in this. So that actually they're open and willing to engage with us. They're willing to engage with us around questions that look at the complexities and the challenges of ethnicity, but actually think about how practical relationships can be built across those boundaries. And that's very much the direction we try to go into in terms of building uh, cross-border relationships within the Raleigh project. Great, a huge question, but thanks for uh, th those insights. Um, and a huge thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we're closing out now, but maybe we could just give them a quick round of applause in, in the chat. Absolutely. All right, so now I will pass it back over to Jen. Thanks, Bryce, and, and thanks really for that panel. Um, I was really excited about today. Yesterday, we did a lot of learning about what we've been doing, but looking into the future is, is, is really thrilling. And I think this is a big part of that. We called it futures with an S because those of us who are having these conversations now at this symposium of practice around this, it's up to us now to look at the different ways that this could be taken forward. So if you're looking for the manual on how to integrate TWP and behavior science, it does not yet exist, right? We're having these conversations. There are some tools out there that have already been looking at these. There's um, USAID has a um, behavior framed APA that's being coming out of the health, um, the health work. So it's, it's nascent, it is starting, but it's up to us to, to, to determine the different ways to take this. That's one thought. And then just coming out of this last, last conversation, um, I, I took a peek at the chat um, and I saw that that David um, Jacob sign was saying it turns out that we're here to fix you doesn't work as well as we're here to support you. And I think one of the findings that came out of our study on our TWP practice, something that a um, number of us have been thinking about a lot here at Kamonic, is how do you actually start though with the assets and we look at that question of the precision of the question that you're that you're asking under a or the precision of the question you're asking about what behavior, you're not walking in and saying, I'm here to change your behavior. That doesn't happen, it shouldn't happen anyway, right? As Maria was saying. And so the question of what are you doing well? What is working well? Where are your assets? What are your aspirations coming from an inquiry sort of perspective, an assets-based perspective, looking at positive deviance, where are things, where, who are the people who are actually already doing the things? These are their countries. Many of you are from these countries, where, what are your aspirations for you know, how things should be working better for your communities? And let's see how we can work towards those that public interest together. And what can we do the, who are intervening in our interventions, who are implementing things on behalf of clients, on behalf of, of others, what can we do to then support that? So terrific panel, thank you so much. We are now going to go on break for seven minutes. <laughs> The, um, the Zoom will stay active. Um, please go and do whatever you need to do and come back. You're going to want to come back. Um, the next panel, the last session of the symposium, um, I am really excited about because we are going to get out of the echo chamber um, of Washington DC or even out of the echo chamber of, of projects um, that are on the line and others. And we are actually gonna go talk to some real reformers People who are actually doing this on the front lines of the, the work in their own countries and talk about the interaction between politically and the work that these reformers are doing every day. So come back on the hour and we'll see you then. Thank you.